So the next presentation will be about putting incorporation into context and trying to give you some, some more concrete tools and points of reference to go away and discuss um, incorporation and what it means and what it might look like in these different models that Casey were introducing before our group discussion and what they look like in practice so you can go away and discuss that with your stakeholders and your communities and the people that you work with. Um, and we'll be doing that um, through case studies. Um, so we'll be presenting four case studies in other countries for you today um, that have incorporated human rights in different ways. And we're going to be using this framework that Casey introduced earlier of looking first at the legal effects of how was human rights incorporated, how was it given effect in the law, how has it been enforced, what are the different enforcement mechanisms that were brought about in those countries, and then what has that led to in terms of cultural change. And in cultural change we're looking at both increased awareness and ownership among duty bearers and right holders and also what has happened afterwards, what has the experience of that country been. We'll also take you through how long the incorporation process took and a little bit of insight into what that process looked like in these other countries and what they went through. And you will culminate this in a best practice framework that we've derived from our case studies. So these are just points in each of these categories that should accompany incorporation. And uh, brilliant, so I'll give it to Wayne again and show you. All right, thanks. So, we, um, so yeah, the first case study that we're going to look at today is uh, on Iceland and how they've incorporated human rights. So, a few things at first. So, Iceland is a dualist legal system. So, that means that um, after you've ratified a con convention, uh, it must be put into domestic law for it to have legal effect in domestic law. So that means that you need to basically um, somehow um, make that part of your domestic law so that it, so that you can actually bring cases in court, uh, for example, or rely on this convention. Um, so where are the sources in Icelandic human rights law? So first of all, there's the Icelandic constitution. Um, so that has um, typically to Nordic constitutions, uh, it has a chapter on human rights protections. So this is not constitutional incorporation, but um, the reason why I talk about it is because uh, it demonstrates quite a strong form for human rights protection being at the highest level of law, and also because the constitution has often been used in case law uh, together with incorporated conventions to kind of like reinforce, mutually reinforce each other. Uh, as a source for rights. And so the two and only uh, human rights conventions so far that items incorporated are the uh, ECHR in 94 and the CRC in 2013. And they've both been uh, fully and directly transposed into domestic law. Right. So just briefly about the convention, uh, sorry, the constitution. So in 95, um, kind of coinciding with um, the ECHR incorporation, um, there is a constitutional reform effort in Iceland. And to not, not to make this too boring, just quickly run through it. Um, so, um, so there was a human rights chapter included into the Icelandic constitution, which then meant that um, human rights were kind of harmonized and, um, and basically it facilitated for the uh, effect that the ECHR would also have in enforcing human rights uh, from the kind of international level to the domestic level in Iceland. Um, and the explanatory report for the constitution states that um, the international human rights uh, conventions such as the ICPR, ICESCR, European Social Charter, CETL, had a really strong effect on um, the legislators who were making this con uh, constitution to actually think about what kind of rights you want to have in domestic law. So um, Iceland was like, strongly following their kind of international obligations, what they felt like the trends in international law were at the moment, uh, to realize that people's rights should be universal and also that these rights should be reflected in Icelandic law as well. Um, and the constitution has basically these four kinds of different rights, so like equality, non-discrimination, civil political rights, ESC rights, uh, 
importantly, and also children's rights specifically. Right. And then at the same time, um, what was happening was the incorporation of ECHR. And so the aims of this um, uh, were to strengthen rights protection and avoid uncertainties of applying ECHR in domestic courts. So what incorporation does is uh, it brings uh, international rights into domestic law. And in Iceland this meant that uh, previously there had been kind of confusion, like uh, of course we mentioned the ECHR in court, but then, oh actually it's not part of our domestic law, so is it enforceable? Can we, can we use this convention? So incorporation actually solved those problems and made it justiciable in uh, Iceland, so people could actually rely on these exact rights that were in international law, but now in domestic law. So it solidified that base. Um, uh, the ECHR has been the level of an ordinary statute, but in fact, in court cases often, um, it's been given kind of, kind of like a special position in that courts apply the constitution uh, and the ECHR in kind of like an interpretive way. So the constitution may not have very specified, you know, uh, like outlining of what each right means, but then they bring in the ECHR to interpret that. Um, uh, and also, the ECHR has been used as a, like a regular statutory instrument in courts, so um, as like a, any way a domestic law would be used. Uh, right. And so then there's a the CRC. So similarly to how it's been in Scotland, you know, it's been quite a long road uh, from ratifying this convention to actually realising all the rights contained within it in domestic law. So Iceland already ratified it in 92, but it was only incorporated in 2013 uh, with the aim to strengthen children's rights protection and fill in existing gaps in domestic law below, like several years of other kind of small improvements in law. And a really important and quite telling example of this is uh, that in 2008 there was this case um, involving corporal punishment so where the Icelandic um, Supreme Court um, ruled in a case concerning basically a stepfather spanking two of his stepsons that corporal punishment actually wasn't um, uh, against the law in that case as long as it did not cause children mental or physical harm and that made some of the civil society and a lot of like just the population um, be a bit like hold up we thought corporal punishment was banned and it should be banned under uh, the CRC, for example. And this illustrated that um, that not only was children's rights protection as strong as they thought in Iceland, and that there was actually a need to fill in these gaps, but that children were uh, effectively less protected from violence than adults were, uh, because some cases of violence, like corporal punishment, were allowed. Um, and that caused a kind of a public uproar, which then, as one of those steps, uh, finally led to like improvements in law, and then finally the incorporation of the CRC. But that was obviously not the only step that led to the incorporation of the CRC. Um, yeah, the CRC again has a state of an ordinary act, so uh, acts like any other kind of law, not the supreme status, but again. The CRC and the children's rights provision in the constitution can mutually reinforce each other. Um, so far, not that frequently used in courts. Um, it is quite a new case, uh, not a new uh, sorry law still. Um, but in 2017, there was um, so there were signs that the CRC is actually having uh, a positive effect on children's rights in Iceland. So there was a Supreme Court case. Uh, on custody of a child, which basically sent the case back to the district court, district court to be reviewed because uh, the Supreme Court found that under CRC, um, the child's rights, uh, the child's view to be heard, so right to be heard, sorry, uh, in the custody case was not, had not sufficiently been fulfilled. Um, so generally in Iceland where the CRC has been used, it's had very positive outcomes for children so far. 
in the like, enforcement of this right. So again, here you can see that the color coding has been used the same way as it was in that circle of the pie chart. Right, just about ownership of rights. Um, so going beyond the law and going beyond the courts themselves. Um, um, there's, for example, the Icelandic Children's Ombudsman. So uh, they're basically a public authority who oversee the further well-being of children and look after their interests, uh, an interest against the state, for example, and public and private parties acting on behalf of the state. Um, they also produce things like educational leaflets, um, training, this kind of stuff. They don't, they're not in charge of education in schools, that would be the Ministry of Education, but, but um, they basically act as the public body of awareness raising of what the CRC is uh, and basically direct children, for example, to bring cases and you know, have to find out more. Um, one really interesting part of what I said is doing really well is actually the second point. So you see the child participation in public consultations. Um, so these are basically take, take forms of forms where there might be some government representatives, the ombudsman, etc. Uh, and then they actually invite um, a number of children to talk about their views, uh, to talk about problems, identify gaps in perhaps implementation of the convention um, in uh, this very kind of like formal setting um, which can then feed into further policy making and uh, reviewing policy objectives. Um, also awareness raising, so after the CRC incorporation, awareness of what the CRC is and what people's rights are in the CRC. Um, has been more extensive than it was before incorporation because that's also something that the CRC mandates for is education training on what the convention consists of. And you can, can you can compare that, for example, with how um, CRC, which is incorporated, and for example the CEDAW, which has not been incorporated, how the awareness of these two conventions differ. So uh, the Icelandic Women's Rights Organization has, for example, reported that the seed or there's not very much knowledge, um, particularly particularly among rights holders of what the seed or is and how to use it and when to know that there's been a breach. Because the Iceland, Iceland has not incorporated, but it has ratified it, so it would technically still be bound to follow it on this edge. Right? Um, yeah, and then there's the participatory process in law reform. So, something I didn't mentioned before was there was also an, uh, kind of another instance of China um, make the human rights provisions in the constitution even more like more expansive but that eventually failed but it was it consisted of a public uh, uh, participatory process where uh, the public so citizens were invited to feed in on what they think should be a human right under the constitution uh, so although this uh, process failed, it did have the effect of um, of the public gaining a stronger awareness of what human rights are and what their human rights are um, under the constitution. So this uh, so public participatory process when making laws and policies are a very important aspect of basically raising awareness. Um, yeah, then there's also the Child Friendly Cities initiative that was uh, implemented after um, the CRC incorporation. So it's a UNICEF, UNICEF initiative um, where basically cities are uh, following the CRC uh, and to, to see like how you can make a city more child and uh, family friendly. Uh, that's been trial in the UK as well at the moment. So basically under the principles of the CRC, so how can you kind of uh, increase services for, for uh, services or some hobbies, uh, education to make it more child inclusive? Uh, that's working quite well at the moment. Also, human rights and democracy is something that's mentioned as uh, in the educational curriculum license, something that should be followed. Um, 
and also some units of schools have um, specific education uh, rights under the CRC for children. That's just been a bit kind of inconsistent, um, a lot of like, you know, statewide inconsistency in how that's being applied. So it's a good start, but it should be, there should be a unified approach on uh, how to teach children about their rights under the CRC or under human rights conventions or in the context of human rights in the first place. So this is just something ICE is doing. They're doing other stuff as well uh, in terms of awareness and ownership, but at least some good aspects. Uh, just to quickly recap, so, um, yeah, so mainly the CRC in cooperation with ICE has been quite a long process, same as in Scotland and uh, the UK. It's not an overnight thing. It doesn't also it doesn't happen in one go, so there will be many steps to it from basically the ratification of the convention to all the way to, you know, um, when it gets incorporated and not only that, but gets realised in practice. Um, yeah, and ISIN's been there doing that very well. Um, yeah, so one thing, the importance of data collection, so for example, um, no, that, that's always a problem with all human rights really, isn't it, uh, in all states. Iceland has that as well, so part of why the education aspect of human rights is not very uh, necessarily like uniform or effective at the moment is because you can't, um, they don't have data on intersecting disadvantages, so basically, for example, what do children with migrant backgrounds need uh, that are different to children who are from uh, not a migrant background. Um, so data collection in order to improve the implementation and to identify gaps uh, in, for example, need for education, and that's very important to, uh, to take away from this. And yeah, like I mentioned, there should be more of a uniform statewide um, approach to human rights education so that everyone kind of has the same uh, knowledge what their human rights are, um, so that they can enforce them equally as well. And yeah, one really good aspect to take away, so the consultation processes, um, where children themselves get to have an input uh, on what's working well in the terms of the CRC rights that have been incorporated and what they don't um, have that much awareness of and uh, what could be improved. So, yeah, so this is what ISIS has been doing. And Sophie's now going to talk about Norway, similar context. Okay. Um, so, we'll look at a, our second country, um, Norway, which has a lot of things in common with Norway and Iceland. Um, and one of them is uh, its relationship between international and domestic law. So, Norway is another dualist country, uh, meaning that we have to incorporate international law into national law in order to give it effect, which I've tried to illustrate here with the jigsaw. That's also hopefully that makes sense as a concept. Um, and there are two sources of human rights law in Norway. The first is the human rights law from 1999, um, which I'll talk more about. And the second is the written constitution from 1814, which was amended in 19, uh, 2014 to include a chapter of human rights. Um, I'll not talk about the Constitution too much, it's not the most relevant source of human rights, but it is an interesting example because following this um, update of the Constitution in 2014, everyone was really excited about this one article that said that now Norway had to comply with all of its international human rights obligations. And that was really exciting because people thought this was incorporation of all of the human rights treaties ratified by Norway until a Supreme Court judgment in 2016 said it wasn't. Um, so what they said in that case, uh, the, the applicant was trying to rely on the Convention of the International Labour Organization that had been ratified, but not otherwise put into law. Um, and the Supreme Court went, no, this, this constitutional inclusion of human rights is too vague. It doesn't specifically say these laws are incorporated and applies in legal law, so it is an incorporation. And it just goes to illustrate how important, how important clear language is. And when we're talking about incorporation, we have to ensure that the legislation actually says what we want it to say and do. And it says now this international instrument is part of Norwegian or Scots law. 
Um, and that is what happened in the human, well now actually people don't really know what that constitutional amendment means, so we're going to focus on the human rights law from 1999 instead, which in contrast is an extremely clear piece of legislation. And what you see here is actually more or less the contents of that act. Um, so it sets out the purpose, which is to strengthen the position of the human rights in Norwegian law. Um, and then it lists the treaties that are now going to be part of Norwegian law. It simply says the ICCPR will be part of Norwegian law, the ECHR will be part of Norwegian law, and the ICSR will be part of Norwegian law. Um, then it proceeds to say that these human rights treaties rank higher than other Norwegian law, so it's the highest ranking um, law in the country, together with the constitution, well, below the constitution, um, but mutually reinforcing, like in Iceland. Um, and then it goes on to, and that means the courts have a strike down power. So that means that if Norwegian law is not compatible with the human rights treaties that have been incorporated, this piece of legislation ranks higher, and other legislation can be can be struck down by courts um, in case that there is a finding of incompatibility. Um, what it also allows for is flexibility. So in 2003 and 2009. This piece of legislation was amended to incorporate the UNCRC and the CEDAW, so the Convention on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Um, so it's all the same law, incorporating all of these treaties verbatim, so it's an example of direct and full incorporation that Casey explained earlier, where nothing is translated, it's all just put verbatim into Norwegian law. Um, just a point on the amendment, so this is a great example of, of a flexible incorporation of legislation. Um, but Norway decided to incorporate first and foremost what they deemed the core human rights treaty, so the ICCPR, the ECHR, and the ICESCA, and the reason they called these the core and not the wider um, core, the whole of the core human rights, was that they are universal, so they apply to everyone. Um, and, and it allows for the flexibility then of incorporating children's rights and women's rights later, but this comes with certain risks. So it was successful for the UNCRC and the CEDAW, However, the Convention on Elimination of Racial Discrimination was incorporated, also directly, also verbatim and in full, but in a separate piece of legislation that does not rank above the Norwegian rules. So effectively, it's giving lower protection to the specific rights of ethnic minorities. Similarly, two years ago, there was a failure. In, in, um, civil society failed to put through a certain um, sorry, political parties fail to incorporate the Convention on Protection of Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So again, there's a risk of not incorporating all rights at once, that it won't happen or that those rights will be given a lower standard. Um, so why did Norway go for this model? Um, the main reason that the policy documents around the Act from 1999 cites is that Norway wants to signal its international commitment to human rights. So it's very similar to this human rights leadership argument that we have in Scotland at the moment. They're like, we are going to take a stance and lead the way in the world and incorporate human rights into our domestic law. Um, Norway then went for the model of law, uh, incorporation by transposition, so transposing the treaties directly verbatim into Norwegian law. And the specific reason for this model of incorporation was to contribute to this universal international understanding of human rights and to the living instruments rather than creating a translated version, rather than sort of risk watering down that language. And there was also arguments that simply that was what all the states had been doing in Europe and they wanted to, to follow, um, follow the norm. But, but predominantly it was thought that this was the strongest level of protection and it set the best example internationally as well. Um, and then finally, one of the reasons was that they thought incorporating the conventions themselves rather than the sort of Norwegian catalogue of human rights would increase the knowledge of international human rights and those conventions among both duty bearers and right holders. Um, so on effect of justiciability, after the incorporation of the ECHR, ISSGA, and well, all of the rights I listed before, um, there was an increase in cases in Norwegian courts, in particular on the ECHR, so similar cases to the ones that are being brought under the Human Rights Act in the UK. There's a surge in cases in particular on asylum law um, and under the penal code and uh, criminal proceedings. Um, and likewise, 
there was increased distributability of children's rights, and the Norwegian government reported that children's rights are sort of filtered in through the government ministries and the parliament, and now the convention is becoming common language. People are speaking about it after incorporation. Um, on the other hand, however, um, the ICESCO has not, so the economic, social, and cultural rights, although incorporated directly and fully, have not really been invoked. And one really interesting point is that despite direct incorporation, the Supreme Court of Norway has gone out and said, actually, the provisions of the ICESCO are too vague for us to make them justiciable. So they're not clear enough for people in Norway to go to court and directly claim, for example, the right to an adequate standard of living, the right to housing, um, the right to health, um, and that is despite the recommendations from the treaty bodies that actually these provisions are clear enough to be justiciable. And it just provides a lesson that sometimes incorporation alone is not enough to make these rights directly enforceable. Um, and some of the reasons that have been brought up here as, as why this is happening in Norway is a lack of training of the judiciary and the legal profession saying actually if you incorporate you have to train the judges to understand how to apply the different human rights and likewise advocates, the legal profession need to know how to bring these cases and people need to know that they can claim, for example, their right to housing. And so this has been one of the one of the major limitations after incorporating the SS period into the law. A more positive example is the Norwegian Human Rights Action Plan that followed the um, the bill incorporating human rights. So this was adopted very much together. Um, and it's a very comprehensive document, it's a policy document. And it sets out uh, these are the various components. So it has a, a mapping of where new law and policy is needed to give effect to the incorporated treaties, so sort of secondary legislations, places where action needs to be taken. Um, it sets out different enforcement mechanisms that are going to bolster the human rights protection. So for example, it sets out that in every government department there needs to be a human rights contact person who is responsible for overseeing um, human rights in that department. There has to be a forum for them to collaborate across the government. So various enforcement mechanisms are set out. It also sets out um, an obligation of progress monitoring. So the, government, the Norwegian government has to produce a report every year monitoring how they're doing in terms of fulfilling this human rights action plan. What it is lacking here is an independent monitoring because until 2015, Norway didn't have a national human rights institute like the Human Rights Commission in Scotland. And it's widely seen that it's, it's great that the government is going to report on their own progress, but really you need an independent body doing that monitoring job as well. Um, Importantly, they also had a lot of provisions in legal aid recognizing that it's all well and fine that these rights are justiciable, but if people can't access courts, that doesn't mean much. And so legal aid has to be strengthened. Um, and then finally, uh, human rights education in the wider public, so making human rights part of the school curriculum at all levels of education, um, and also providing human rights training for duty bearers. And one thing I found quite impressive about this action plan is, is quite lengthy detailed chapter setting out how the police, the forces, various government agencies will be trained in human rights following the incorporation of human rights treaties. Um, and this all feeds into this idea of awareness and ownership of human rights and this kind of cultural change that we're hoping that incorporation can give. So in the mapping out of needed legislation, there was a participatory approach, so they got civil society together. Um, I think only a hundred or maybe twice, not the, the widest participatory um, organization, but at least they had people involved in saying where do we need to immediately focus on human rights. And also recognizing that they couldn't do everything at once, but at least deciding what are the, what are the areas we need to prioritize. Um, there was great focus on human rights in courts after some training of the legal profession, but arguably not enough. Um, with the contact persons in government and in parliament and then human rights education and training. And it just led to a greater awareness both among rights holders but also among duty bearers of this new piece of legislation and of the meaning of human rights in Norway. Um, so to summarize the key lessons, uh, this is an example of full and direct incorporation by transposition. So as opposed to translating human rights into a sort of um, newly worded bill of rights, uh, this is verbatim 
Um, it also shows that it's possible to stagger an incorporation of different treaties that do it at different times, but that there are certain risks to this kind of approach. Um, the example of the Norwegian constitution and also of the incorporation of the SESCO, which didn't lead to justiciability, just reiterates the importance of clear language when we're incorporating. We need the law to say what we want it to do, otherwise there's no guarantee that this is what's going to happen. Um, and then finally, it's a good example of the need for a thorough and comprehensive action plan to accompany incorporation. Incorporation is only the starting point, and there has to be very solid implementation mechanisms that accompany it. And we'll go to the next country, and we're going to on South Africa. Great. So, just moving the continent now, but in fact, you'll see that the legal system is not that different. Um, so again, South Africa is a dualist legal system. So again, same applies. You need to have rights in domestic law for them to, for them to be enforceable, of course. Um, and South Africa um, has a couple different types of incorporation. So first of all, there is uh, indirect incorporation, so through the const constitution. Um, and then secondly, there is um, a partial or piecemeal incorporation of uh, some treaties. So, for example, the, the one the one example I'm going to give here today, non exhaustive list, but uh, is from the UN Convention Against Torture and how some Africans dealt with that. Um, so, to start with the constitutional incorporation and the constitutional role. Um, so, as I believe all you know, all you know um, South Africa came out of a period of apartheid in. 94, um, and this new constitution that was drafted uh, was founded on the values of non-racialism and non-sexism. So it was basically quite like a specific um, ground or like basis that they started building on. So it was basically to heal the divisions of the past and establish a society based on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental mental human rights. Uh, these are values that are echoed throughout the constitution, so it, it, it does actually give them quite a very like, strong sound, sounding in, in the South African constitution. Uh, and so South Africa had been left out of uh, much of the international human rights scene uh, due to like, sanctions during apartheid and just uh, all this. So uh, it actually, the country actually ratified uh, a lot of the human rights conventions in the 90s, which um, which can, can be seen as kind of a reflection in the Bill of Rights that I'm going to be talking about next. So it just uh, it, it was very keen on ratifying and bringing effect to all of these human rights, um, which it had not had uh, during apartheid for citizens equally. Right. So the Bill of Rights. So that's basically Chapter Two of the Constitution. Uh, which indirectly incorporates, so basically translates rights from, for example, the UDHR, the ICPR, ICESCR, CRC, you name it, um, into almost identical languages that what they would be in the conventions themselves, but um, together into like a one bill, one chapter in the human uh, in the constitution. Right, so uh, in that sense, you say that, um, for example, you know, the Scottish Bill of Rights is being um, proposed. Um, that would that would also have not only ICESCA rights, but also other types of rights contained within it. So it is possible to have essentially one bill with you know, a list of all the rights rights within it. Although otherwise, it would not be uh, necessarily comparable to the South African one. Um, but yeah, as I said, that bill really mirrors the language in the um, in the UN Rights Treaties, and um, basically having this kind of bill of rights uh, instead of just separate pieces of legislation here and there um, does have a double advantage in some sense. So it provides uniformity between South Africa's domestic law and international human rights standards. So they're directly comparable. Um, also, it directs courts to a legitimate international resource for the interpretation of these rights. So there won't be any question as to 
where, what kind of like what these rights should contain and where they're coming from. Uh, so this kind of incorporation uh, does many advantages, and also the fact that uh, this Bill of Rights is contained within the Constitution means that these incorporated human rights have an unquestionable highest level of protection uh, in domestic law, in the legal system. And it is in turn, in, in quite an impressive suite of rights in that uh, it has involved over 30 articles just on human rights and how they should be used. Um, one very interesting and clever built-in mechanism that the Constitution and the Bill of Rights also has is that the Constitution mandates that courts, uh, when interpreting bill, a bill, the Bill of Rights or any kind of legislation, they must take into account, first of all, the rights, the human rights contained within the Bill of Rights. So not just when they interpret human rights related cases, but um, all legislation. Uh, so they must look at what the Bill of Rights uh, has, like what kind of power it has to play in there. And for example, um, section 233 also says that um, when interpreting any legislation, every court must prefer any reasonable interpretation of the legislation that is consistent with international law over any alternative interpretation that is inconsistent with international law. So the South African Constitution uh, ensures that international law and evolving international law as well is uh, always taken into account uh, when looking at, for example, case law and decisions within case law. And this um, this has actually worked quite well in the in the court system. Um, and the Supreme Court, for example, regularly makes reference not only in not only to the rights uh, that have been incorporated into the Constitution, but also in addition to the International Convention. So again, they have this kind of double mutually reinforcing effect. Right, so now I'm just going to give a quick example of uh, how South Africa, for example, does partial incorporation. So, these me the words to draw up incorporation. So, this is from the UN Convention Against Torture. So, um, there, the UN um, treaty bodies had uh, basically given feedback to South Africa that uh, you need to incorporate the CAT because there was a lack in the area of. Uh, having this separate freestanding crime of torture. So the, in 2013, the Prevention of Combating and Torture of Persons Act uh, incorporated uh, basically the, defen uh, the definition of torture from the CAT. So it didn't incorporate the rest of the CAT, it incorporated the, that part of the CAT which defines uh, what torture is according to the CAT. So, and the purpose actually, it actually states on this bill that the purpose of the bill, one of the purposes, is to give effect to the Republic's obligations in terms of the UN Convention Against Torture. So, that is also again a quite a clear piece of, uh, clear way of incorporating the definition is to basically copy paste it from the cap, more or less. Um, one thing about partial incorporation is, and you can see it better with other conventions such as the CEDAW uh, is that there's a high risk that when you don't incorporate the whole convention, just incorporate one piece of it, you ignore the um, kind of mechanism that the convention uh, is as a whole, and it might, although, although you might have one article there uh, that's incorporated, it might leave out something that from the rest of the convention really affects the right that you've just been. Uh, you've just incorporated, so um, so it might leave gaps in the protection if you just incorporate one clause but ignore what another clause is saying. Because the, there's the idea that all rights uh, are interdependent. Um, okay, so I'll quickly run through this example of enforcement and basically how we translate into rights on the ground. So the treatment action uh, campaign is a suicide group uh, and they brought this case in 2002 um, on basically making 
ESC rights justiciable um, because it was a large AIDS epidemic affecting over six million people in South Africa, uh, and it it ended up with uh, basically the courts confirming that that um, in fact a right to access to healthcare uh, is justiciable and that there that the state is responsible for having. Uh, minimum standard of healthcare, so providing antiretroviral drugs at least to uh, mothers who, uh, where in cases where there's mother to child tra transmissions of HIV, and um, you can see that that's actually uh, been a victory not only in the court but also on the on the ground, and has actually resulted in uh, change in policy, change in basically healthcare, and uh, again. A decline in infant uh, deaths due to mother to child transmission of HIV. I see we're running out of time a bit, unfortunately. But yeah, South Africa is a good case uh, example of how um, how to make a good piece of legislation and then enforce it in courts. But unfortunately, the chain often stops there. So um, there's a huge gaps in human rights protections. Uh, when it comes to law versus actually on the ground and when it comes to awareness of, for example, duty bearers like police officers, how they should act under uh, the incorporated obligations from, for example, the CEDAW when it comes to cases of sexual violence victims and what the, you know, uh, executive's role is there. Um, South Africa also doesn't have a national action plan on human rights, uh, so no uniform approach there. But there have been some uh, really good victories uh, in um, the last point there. So it kind of like cross-sectoral uh, organization. So police working together with, for example, rape crisis centers and doctors to address issues on the ground. Uh, right, I think we have to move on. So all of what I've just said is already in here, actually. Um, To move on to the last example, yeah. Maybe it's a good thing that we're running a bit short of time because I get really fascinated by Switzerland, so then I won't bore you about my own fascination um, with, the, with the country and its uh, legal and political system. So, the last uh, example is incorporation of human rights in Switzerland. Um, and Switzerland differs from the other three countries and the UK in that it's a modest legal uh, system meaning that international law that has been ratified by Switzerland automatically applies um, to the extent that it is directly political, which I will come to later as an example. But it is automatically part of Swiss, Swiss law once the country has ratified an international convention. Um, and then another thing that's interesting about Switzerland is that, uh, and where it compares to the UK is that it is made up of several um, in the somewhat independent administration, so it's a federal country, it's made up of 26 different cantons um, that have a high level of autonomy, and this, this gives an interesting landscape for human rights protection. So the cantons, um, are kind of similar to, to Scotland in the UK context, they have their own parliament, their own government, their own court system, you have 26 different educational systems, um, different tax rates, etc. It's a highly autonomous small state within a federal system. And that means that the um, the sources of law look a little bit like this, so you have cantonal law, you have federal law, and then you have international law. And similarly, the sources of human rights law in Switzerland are international human rights law that are directly uh, counting as Swiss law because of the principle of monism. And you have the federal constitution, which was um, adopted in 1999. And then you have a cantonal constitution at each, at each of these um, devolved administrative levels. Um, and that's quite an interesting example because some of the cancellal constitutions go beyond the human rights protection existing both at international and at federal level. Um, and it just provides a sort of precedence for what Scotland is trying to do, which is going beyond what's protected at the state level in the UK and actually providing a higher level of human rights protection. So this is happening elsewhere in Europe. Um, it's also, in, in Switzerland, what happens if someone goes to court um, on a human, and brings a human rights case, it is the highest level of all of these different sources of human rights protection that will apply to that case. So if the canton that that person is a resident in has a higher level of human rights protection, that's what's going to apply. Um, 
Well, I will focus today on the federal constitution because that provides the most ex interesting example of incorporation. And so the federal constitution was adopted in 1999. It is an example of, um, of direct incorporation of the ECHR by translation. Um, so it takes a really prominent place in the constitution. It's the second chapter. It's got, uh, I think, 40 plus articles setting out human rights. Um, it was a really lengthy process of adopting the constitution. I think the process ran roughly from the sort of post-war period first drafts in the 1960s and then it was adopted like almost 40 years later. So an extremely long process with various drafts of human rights. Um, in the end, Switzerland went with this autonomous approach of translating human rights into a Swiss Bill of Rights. And part of the reason for that was to add legitimacy. So they wanted the human rights to really belong to the Swiss people, not in the sense that they only apply to the Swiss people and not to other people, but in the sense that people thought that it was legitimate that they took part in the process of saying what should be law. And that goes together with the, the country's um, culture of direct and participatory democracy. So there was a referendum at the end, and the country actually adopted um, the constitution after a lot of public consultation and the public vote. Um, so another reason for using the autonomous version and translating the ECHR predominantly into the constitution was to modernize, the, they wanted to modernize the language. They thought the language of the ECHR, which was written in the 40s, is actually outdated. Um, and we want to make it more modern. So for example, in the rights of privacy, it refers, instead of referring to protection of people's correspondence, it refers to protection of people's data and telecommunications. In effect, however, this doesn't really legally add anything. It maybe makes the constitution easier to understand because it refers to things that are more relatable. Um, but that standard of protection would already be applied in courts due to this, this interpretation of human rights as a living instrument that Casey was covering earlier. So human rights already evolved with technology and with society, even if the text remains somewhat outdated at times. Um, they also wanted an um, autonomous solution so that they could use multiple sources. So it's not just an incorporation of the ECHR, it's also an inclusion of constitutional principles from other jurisdictions. So they looked it up to the French constitution, to the German constitution, and then they incorporated um, or included the Swiss constitutional principles. And um, so in the Bill of Rights itself, in the we have the civil and political rights from the ECHR. Um, and then it goes a bit beyond and it incorporates or it includes a right of children and young people. And here we have an example of a sort of indirect attempt at incorporating the UNCRC, but without actually ever referencing the UNCRC. So there has not been any cases relying on this being actual incorporation. Um, and again, this reiterates this importance of clear language. If you want to incorporate a treaty, it has to say we are incorporating this treaty. Um, similarly, it includes a self-standing right um, to non-discrimination, which is not included in the, in the ECHR. Um, and then it has, and again, this is where these constitutional principles and different sources of human rights law come in. So Switzerland has some homegrown rights in their constitutional bill of rights. And these are rights that just came out of their own constitutional history. And one of them is really interesting because of their participatory um, democracy. They have a right whenever there's a referendum. I just thought I'd share you, you might appreciate this as a human right. Um, whenever there's a referendum, people have the right for the government to provide them with clear and accurate and independent information that is unbiased so that they may make an informed decision. So maybe there's something for the youth to learn there as well. Um, but it is not a right that exists uh, per se at the international level. And then finally, it goes beyond the ECHR on social, social rights. It doesn't incorporate the ICESCA, but it does incorporate um, social minimum rights. And again, this actually comes from constitutional history, but it corresponds roughly to this core minimum principles of the um, economic, social, and cultural rights. And, and there's a bit of history on that. So the in case law before the Bill of Rights came in, um, the, because of monism, technically the ICESCA and ESC rights should apply in Swiss law, but the Supreme Court has said, similar to Norway, these are too vague. They do not have a direct applicability. The, the, the rights contained in the, in the common social economic rights is simply too vague for us to 
allow people to claim them in court. Um, again, contrary to what the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights say and how they interpret the Convention. Um, so this was was codified in the Bill of Rights to say, well, actually, we're not going to include them, but we are going to include another principle, which is this right to a social minimum. So they derived from human dignity as a principle um, in another case that came before the Constitution, that if that people have a right to sort of the needs for basic survival, so basic housing, basic allowance of food, of clothing, basic education, a, a right to basic legal aid if you need to bring a case and you can't otherwise afford it. Um, and this sort of distinction that already existed was then codified in the Constitution as a very clear distinction between social rights, which are these minimum basic survival entitlements, and then social objectives. And these are very clearly set out as social objectives with an article saying these shall not give rise to individual claims in court. Um, so it's a sort of, what we end up with is an example of a very partial incorporation of, of the um, rights contained in the access care. Um, okay. So in terms of enforcement, um, the strengths and limitations of how human rights have been enforced in Switzerland, so it does include in the Bill of Rights this full duty to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights. We have a full compliance duty, which is really important. Um, and there is also explanation to the Constitution saying that human rights should be justiciable in the courts, they should also be indirectly justiciable in the sense that, that legislation should always be interpreted as if it conforms with human rights, if that's at all possible. Um, and then human rights law should mandate new law and policies, so this should be the task of law, uh, of the government and parliament to make new laws and new policies to give full effect to human rights in Switzerland. Um, and one of the sort of enforcement checks that will put in place is that when government produces uh, new legislation that goes to parliament, this has to be accompanied by an explanatory note. And then if the person writing that explanatory note thinks it's relevant, they have to produce uh, something similar to a human rights impact assessment. And um, the problem with this is that they sort of lack teeth in that there is no independent oversight um, of these enforcement mechanisms. And a, a big lack of human rights enforcement is that Switzerland doesn't have a national institute for human rights, so there's no independent body monitoring compliance with the Bill of Rights um, or, or monitoring the sort of progression of human rights in the country. And then the final limitation um, is that the Bill of Rights, <coughs> so the Constitution, is not actually, it doesn't rank above Acts of Parliament, so kind of similar to the principle of parliamentary sovereignty in the UK. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, bills, uh, the courts of the Supreme Court in Switzerland can't strike down Acts of Parliament because they don't comply with the human rights in the Constitution. So even if they find that actually a, an Act of Parliament is an unconstitutional and violates these human rights, it can't strike it down. However, the courts can strike down acts of parliament if they don't comply with international law. And this means that effectively the European Convention of Human Rights is a, is a stronger instrument to rely on. And what that sort of does is make the whole Bill of Rights a little bit irrelevant at certain times because actually it's not enforceable against the parliament where it's international law is. And I think the lesson to draw from that is just to make, again, make sure that the, the incorporating legislation actually is relevant, that it provides the highest possible level of protection, that you have a strike down power saying if legislation from the Scottish Parliament is um, is incompatible with this bill of rights, courts need to be able to set it aside. Yeah. Right. So the key lessons, it's an example of incorporation by translation, so an autonomous bill of rights drawing from different sources, this is an example of what that can look like. Um, the importance of strike down powers of courts and being clear of where the law ranks in relation to other laws. Um, and again, an important lesson that um, writing human rights into law is only a first step. There has to be independent monitoring mechanisms, there has to be implementation that facilitates making those rights more. Yeah. Right, I think that's us. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, sorry, best practice. Right. Right. So we are out of time, so. Just 10 seconds on this. So basically, you should have this best uh, practice framework document in front of you or somewhere on the tables. Uh, it again follows this color code because we're really into that. Um, 
on legal effect, enforcement, and cultural change. So what we've just been talking about, and also wider examples from the UK, and I think also some examples we didn't have the chance to mention in these presentations. Thank you.